I'm Martin Cooper, call me Marty. Yeah, I'm known as the father of the cell phone. My colleagues and I introduced the very first cell phone to the world. From my earliest memories, even when I was a little boy, I was taking things apart. Uh, I saw some kids on the street uh, burning a piece of paper using a magnifying glass. I wanted to do that. I broke a Coke bottle and tried to make a lens out of it. Failed, of course. But I always knew I was going to be uh, an engineer. Well, back in the uh, early 70s, uh, I was with Motorola. Uh, we were a leader in the two-way radio business. The radio channels were the basis of what our business was. Uh, AT&T came along and said, well, we're going to set you free, freedom. Now you're going to be trapped in your car instead of in your home or at your desk. Uh, they had invented a thing called cellular telephony that was more spectrally efficient. And what that means is you could have more people talking uh, on every radio channel uh, in a city. Uh, and AT&T said they were going to do everything. They were going to do personal telephone communications. They were going to do dispatch the way the police and uh, fire people work. This was very good for, as far as the FCC was concerned because then they wouldn't have to worry about licensing every single person. They would just give one license to AT&T uh, and they wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Well, we didn't like that very much at Motorola. And that would have essentially taken over our business. And so we started a battle with them in the 60s. The battle consisted of filings to the FCC, hearings in Washington, and around 1972, we heard the FCC is about to make a decision, and we were really worried. We had to get the attention of the people in Washington. We had to demonstrate to them that number one, you didn't have to have a monopoly. You could have competition. Uh, and the second thing is the idea of building a phone that trapped you in a car didn't make any sense to us at all. We believed and believe still today that freedom means you can talk anywhere. And we had to show that a personal portable phone was possible. And the best way to do that is to actually build one. And that's what stimulated building that first cell phone. So here we are on the streets of New York on April 3rd, 1973. I'm with a journalist and I have to make an impression on the guy. And I thought, you're not gonna take a chance and call Joel Engel, who's my counterpart and my nemesis at AT&T. So I picked up the phone and dialed his number. Amazingly, he answered. I said, hi, Joel, it's Marty Cooper. Hi, Marty, he says. I'm calling you from a cell phone, but a real cell phone, a personal, handheld, portable cell phone silence on the other end of the line. I suspect that he was gritting his teeth, but he was polite. We finished the call, and uh, that was the first public cellular telephone call. What I felt when that call worked was a sense of relief. It worked. I didn't think at all that this was a historical moment. This phone had literally thousands of individual parts. This is before the large-scale integrated circuit had been created, the chip. Uh, and so we had to solder each of those individual parts together. We had an engineer standing by in case something broke because it was totally unreliable. I suspect what Joel felt is what he still feels today, annoyance. Do I think that the cell phone was an important creation of history, I think it was one of the crucial things, perhaps as important as the invention of the wheel. We are still in the infancy of what we call a cell phone and personal communications. We are only now learning the kinds of power that we can build into a cell phone, and it will take a couple of generations before we fulfill the real promise of what a cell phone is. All cell phones today are suboptimal. Think about how unnatural it is 
to want to talk to somebody and hold this flat piece of material up to your head doesn't make any sense at all. But in order to capture everything that we're trying to do, we end up with this form factor. So I envision a future in which the talking part, talking's never going to go away. You're always going to want to talk to somebody at some point. Uh, and that point may be uh, embedded under your skin, behind your ear, uh, along with a powerful computer that you can talk to. Someday you'll be able to think to it. Uh, and that will be the, an optimum voice telephone. There will be other devices uh, throughout your body that will be transmitting your body functions for fitness or for the health uh, uh, aspects of it. Uh, and they will go through what I call a personal server, the thing that actually communicates from you to the rest of the world. So the future is starting to come upon us where they're working on the software, getting the software to adapt to people, getting the phone easier to use, more intuitive and more functional. I'm Kim, really uh, interested in uh, artificial intelligence. I think that there are germs of real use of artificial intelligence uh, are just starting to become practical. So I'm thinking of this question of uh, the app, how useless having a million apps is. I mean, how does a person sort through a million apps and find the one that's suitable for their thing? The concept of the app is wrong. When, if you really had good artificial intelligence, you would have a servant, hopefully one that's smarter than you are, figuring out what you need and coming up with solutions. We call those solutions apps, but instead of us looking for the app, the app ought to find us. What do you think of that? What do you, does that make sense? I want you to know that I've never said that before. Don't you think that's a great idea of uh, uh, obsoleting the app by having something that creates the app for you? I love that. We created the first portable cell phone in 1973, and here we are, 42 years later, just starting to get into some of the important features. So all of these things are going to little by little happen, but they won't happen unless uh, some of us keep dreaming about these things uh, and leading the way to the future. I would like to be around uh, indefinitely uh, so that I can uh, see everything that happens uh, in the future. But I know that's not going to happen, uh, so my replacement for that is to uh, sit around and dream about those things. And, and live them uh, in advance of when they happen. <laughs>